Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today's guest is special for multiple reasons. He's here for a rare third visit, but that's not one of the reasons. He's an author and business thinker who has done more to define the business book genre than any other author. He's himself the subject of two biographies. He is, of course, Tom Peters, now author of 19 books, including his latest, Tom Peters' Compact Guide to Excellence. He calls the book the essence of the essence of his work, and it has a different format from Tom's previous books. I'll let him explain in a moment. And I've heard he celebrated an important birthday yesterday. Welcome to the show, Tom, and happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much on both scores, and thank you from, uh, for uh, keeping the birthday a deep, dark secret, the number. It's higher than I It's up to you. I, I, I never yeah. reveal uh, guest secrets, uh, so uh, you know it's, it's up to you, Tom. But uh, I, I will say it was a significant one. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I won't say anymore. Tom, you seem like a man on a mission. You've been following the same theme with your writings for a while now. Do you get at all frustrated that there are still so many people who ignore these important ideas when you, you know, the proof is out there? Uh, you've got lots of data to support what you're saying, but it, not everybody's listening. Well, yeah, yes and no, I guess, is the right answer. Uh, my comment has always been, listen, I've written... 20 books now with this new one and I'm as greedy as the next person and I would love you to buy all of them and I will accept the royalties but the reality is I've said the same damn thing 20 times in a row which is frighteningly close to the truth um, I mean I yeah sure it's frustrating because the the message is very straightforward uh, particularly in terms of people first, and so on. But the flip side of it is, as you know as well as I do, is called the real world. I said to somebody, if uh, Tony Robbins walks into a room with a thousand people, he expects to convert a thousand people by an hour later. If I give a speech to a thousand people and three people walk out and say, holy shit, I'm really going to do something different, to me, I've had a hell of a day. So, you know, you, you pick them off by the onesies and twosies. Uh, and, you know, obvi obviously, I think the stuff is straightforward. Um, well, but you're the neuroscientist. I mean, the, the, rea <laughs> yeah. no, the, the, the reality is people may listen to parts of it, uh, but at some level, they don't get the most important part. Then we can talk about this. Uh, and I, I, I know all the problems with EQ, so I, I won't push that too hard, but hiring for something like EQ to me makes sense. And if not, no go. And God alone knows promoting, you've got to promote people, you should promote people who get off on people. Uh, you know, it's that old when you never, never promote the best salesperson to sales manager. It's people whose pleasure in life is working with other people. And, uh, you know, there was this whole book I read one time on, on promotions. And it said, most important decisions you make in your business life, and either nobody knows how to do them or don't spend enough time on it or what have you. So I'm frustrated as hell. And anybody who listens up to us today and does one tiny thing slightly differently tomorrow will make my day. Well, that's that's a good attitude, Tom. You based uh, this uh, rather uh, simple short volume on your previous book, uh, which had extreme humanism in the title. Can you briefly explain extreme humanism? Yeah. You know, again, as I said, my bottom line, top line is it's all about people and developing people, and my extreme humanism is to push the point in my mind, that those verities about people and training people and developing people are just as valid, if not more valid, in the age of AI than they were when Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Uh, and, and so that's, that's really the point. And the other point, which is frustration, is, and, and I, I want to say this right, because I could say it in a cheesy way, you don't have to do a hell of a lot to get a group of human beings who want to cooperate with each other. There was an experiment that was done, and it was totally legit. And 
teacher stands in the doorway of her or his classroom when the kids are entering. And all she or he does is nod, say good morning, might say, Mary, I know you had a cold last week. How you doing? But not much of that. Just nod, good morning, glad you're here. And it, it, it is, and I really hope people will believe me, measurable differences, uh, disciplinary problems apparently go down by 20%, and measures of intellectual engagement but go up by 20% for standing in the frigging doorway. And, you know, so Ms. Mr. Boss, who is watching us, do you effectively stand in the doorway in the morning? Virtual doorway, real doorway, I don't care which, but, you know, just engage people and make it clear that it's really cool that we're together and doing something, you know, of some significance for the rest of the day. So, you know, that's, that's the, and again, I suspect, you know, better than I, between the two of us, we could trot out uh, 25 examples of that sort of thing that had enough bloody neuroscience, social psych and psych behind it to, uh, you know, sink a ship. Tom, one of the interesting things about uh, your new book is what's well, very different than uh, your previous books in format. It's, uh, it's got this um, little square shape and it's uh, kind of a, it, it's not dense. So lots of pages are simply just a short uh, quote, uh, sometimes just a few words. How, at the same time, this is really sort of distilled knowledge. And I'm thinking that kind of like uh, distilled spirits, you don't want to drink the whole bottle down in one sitting. Uh, how, how would you recommend that people consume this? Well, first of all, let me say that through a friend, the luck God got to me. And on the spine of the book are two names, mine and Nancy Green, who was the designer. And I've been a design fanatic for 25 years, but I didn't really know what I was talking about until this book came along. I mean, I said to Nancy, you ought to be the lead author because it is simple, straightforward sentences, and it is the look, feel, taste, touch, smell of the thing, I think that really projects it. And so, you know, that is, that's just huge for me. Uh, I know what I'd like, and I think we may have said it in the preface, I would love X or Y or Z to go through a few pages and really get hooked you know, by any particular item. I just happened to open it, and this is not for our conversation. Uh, and I opened it to a page that has a quote from the Oscar-winning movie director, uh, Roger Robert Altman. And the quote is, the role of the director is to create a space where actors and actresses can become more than they have ever been before, more than they have ever dreamed of being. And I just love that. And I think it is as true for the head of a 30 person housekeeping department uh, or, you know, or a biotech research group. It's that's, you know, and this does maybe have something to do with my age. Uh, the, the measure of a leader is how did the people who worked for her or him grow? And particularly, how did they grow after they left it? I was giving a speech, maybe it was five years ago, in Mumbai, and in the real world as opposed to the virtual world where, where, you, where you're sitting was a four-star Indian Army general who I think, think ran the whole darned army. And we got talking about something like this, and he said, well, I'm trying to decide whether Roger or Tom ought to get the promotion to general. He said, I only have really one test. And that test is, I go back and find the people who worked for them over the years and try to discover the degree that the two years that they spent with Tom led to the biggest vault in their skill or improvement. He said, you know, that's the measure. The measure is how you affect others not whether, you know, sales went up by seven and a half percent and the margins went up by one eighth of a percent or, or whatever else. It's, and, and I really do think it's, you know, to me, I don't know. It's obviously all people. And one thing I want to say that, that I do want us to get on a little bit, I think it's all people. 
And I think, again, regardless of the business, the most significant driver is the quality of the first line manager. There is enough research to sink a ship that says productivity, profitability, quality, innovativeness, any damn thing you can name is extraordinarily dependent on that first line manager. And I've gone so far, I think I say it in, in this book, that you know we're running, I ain't talking about giant companies. We're running a 200 person company and it has, I don't know, 30 frontline uh, managers. Those 30 frontline managers taken together are asset number one of the corporation. And, you know, there is a one-liner like that that says the sergeants run the army. And by the way, the army <laughs> figured that out long ago. So it's, it's a fact. Do you see companies really emphasizing that, though, as opposed to just saying, well, the first line manager position is, oh, maybe sort of a test bed, uh, throw somebody in there, see how they do, and uh, maybe pretty soon be able to promote them if they do well, uh, as opposed to uh, emphasizing the value of that position in and of itself? Absolutely, positively. Obviously, I haven't done the original research and can't peg it to a percentage, but I think, alas, that your description just then, that is the norm. And my argument, obviously, from the prior thing is that the selection of the frontline manager is a strategic business decision. It is not a promotion decision. It is literally the determination of the effectiveness of the strategy that you tend to be trying to implement in the marketplace, or if it's a public sector organization in the place where human beings use your services or, or, or what have you, but no. Um, and I think incidentally, we can go to this in a while too, is the same thing is true of hiring. I've forgotten the name of the book, but somebody wrote an entire book on hiring and said, it's just insane the degree to which leaders are not trained in hiring people. And, you know, I would, I would not dispute that, but we'll stick, with, we'll stick with where we are. And I just want to make a list of 175 or 175,000 exclamation marks under what you just said. You know, well, you know, we'll put him in this job and see how he does because, you know, maybe he's headed for top management. No, he's going to be in that job maybe for six months, maybe for 18 months, and the people he works with determine the future of my company. Well, I guess so. You can also make the argument that uh, if you have an exceptional crop of first-line managers, when you do need to promote, uh, you'll have uh, some excellent choices, uh, and you'll be basically building the organization from the bottom up. Absolutely. Off. Yeah, absolutely. You should, with, with any luck at all, uh, you should have a basket of people who you have been developing since the first day they walked in your real or virtual door. And so we should have a, a plethora, you know, of candidates. I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more wholeheartedly. Tom, how do you get uh, CEO and top management buy into these ideas? Because I'm sure that uh, you can be very convincing to a lot of people who uh, don't necessarily have the power to affect organizational change. I, I run into that uh, in my uh, own work where uh, people say, oh, these ideas are great, but man, you know, I can't fight the corporate bureaucracy or I can't, uh, uh, yeah. you know, I, I can't uh, get this stuff done because top management isn't committed to it. And, you know, you make uh, uh, the point uh, again about uh, a Milton Friedman's effect and, you know, the sole purpose of a corporation is to create shareholder value. Yeah. And unfortunately, CEOs are often still compensated that way. And you know, if well, you a uh, eight-figure payout well, depending on. Let me tell you where I am now that I'm 100 yeah, years old. The management or the management guru business. Jesus, I hate that word. The Economist invented it in a year-end issue a thousand years ago, and I wish it never had been. Uh, the guru class, of which you are a part, uh, me. I'm blaming me. We focus on the damned Fortune 500 or the FTSE 100 if it's the UK. And the reality is that 7% of Americans work for the Fortune 500, which doing the advanced math suggests that 93% don't. And for people like me, if you went through all of my books you until very recently, you would find fleeting mention 
but I wouldn't focus on the SMEs, the small and the medium-sized enterprises. And per your point, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, this is unfair. One person, two person, three person enterprises employ millions of people, and that's fantastic. But my mental focus is on a company with 50 people, 75 people, 100 people, 125 people, maybe 175 or what have you, uh, a manageable number. And my strong suspicion, and I have no measure of this, is if I had a room full of 50 people running businesses with, on average, 125 employees, uh, and I made this pitch and screamed and yelled and shout, I bet I'd get somewhere with a handful of them. As if I had, you know, if I had a room full of Fortune 500 companies, you know, Tom, go back to bed, you know, get a good night's rest. And I'm sure some, we know some do, there are turnarounds and so on and so forth. The other part that, that makes me laugh is, uh, and this was a million years ago, I worked at McKinsey before it was disgraced. Uh, and a couple of friends of mine at McKinsey studied the 1,000 largest companies either in the world or in America, 40 years worth of results, and not one of 1,000 out the marketplace when you use that 40-year measure. And so my bias, and I mean, I sometimes when I'm in a room that has middle managers, they said, look, you're working in a giant company. It's going downhill. There's not a damn thing you can do about it, but experiment and have fun on the way down. You know, there's this economist, his name is Paul Omerod. <laughs> I just love this. I love the meeting. And it's a serious book, and he's a serious economist and researcher and all that. And he said, I am frequently asked by people, how do I create a small business for myself? And he said, my answer is obvious. Just buy a big one and wait. And, you know, it's, it's smart assery, but it's statistically true at some level. So the real answer to your question is, is I, you know, with you or me or our message, if we were talking to a group of people from 75 person companies, I think we'd get a hell of a lot further than we would with the 75,000 person organizations. Make, makes total sense. Um, I did a workshop uh, in New York City a few weeks ago and uh, I had a commenter who's talking about uh, friction, unnecessary effort, how to uh, reduce it in your employee experience. And uh, the uh, comment from the leader at that was, uh, yes, in our company, reducing friction is a high friction experience uh, just because uh, it's in that situ he's in that situation that uh, uh, did not have the power to really change the uh, corporate yeah. way of doing yeah. things. And so, so it's, I it's will tough. Say, I do this, is, this goes Go all the way back to In Search of Excellence. Um, one of the companies was an auto parts company called the Dana Corporation. Sure. And the CEO is a guy by the name of Ren McPherson, who oddly enough went on to become the dean of the Stanford Business School. Uh, but he said... As I was moving up the ranks in this big company, what I really wanted every couple of years was to inherit some shitty little piece of it with 25 people or 30 people. And I would turn that 30 person outfit into a gem, you know, fit for the tiara of the queen. And he said, I, I, I like to think that I hid from top management for 20 years until they finally said, holy shit, look what happens. These things get better. <laughs> and I was then welcomed into the top ranks. But, you know, it's a cute story, but there's, I think there's an awful lot of truth in that. Well, I guess, yeah, that's uh, one thing that even perhaps uh, not uh, top sea level leadership can do is focus on something what the, that they can control and produce results. And then probably also try and get assignments that let them do that. Uh, you know, if they've uh, if they're in an assignment that is, they've pretty much done what they can with it to look for something else, uh, even if it's not, uh, uh, you know, the next step yeah. up the ladder, maybe it'll give them a chance to do something cool and fun. Would, would you please assign me to a country that's at least 4,000 miles away? Uh, right, so, so I, I can have, I can have my own house to play with. And I think yeah. metaphorically, if not, you know, in reality, that's not a bad idea. That's what I want. Well, sometimes the little uh, divisions are the ones that get overlooked. Uh, they're too small to worry about, yeah. so they don't get all that top management attention. So, That's Tom, right. you mentioned big companies a few times. Are, are there any big companies that seem to be getting it right these days? I'm going to give you an honest answer. 
I have not been studying them close enough to say these four companies are doing it right. Uh, I saw something just a couple of days ago that said that Apple relative to the Facebooks and so on is now the most valuable of that lot. And Apple, mm -hmm. Apple and I go back to about 1985 and between Mr. Jobs and Tim Cook, I think they've done a pretty decent job. Uh, but I would give my left arm to be able to give you a list of seven companies that, that meet your standards. Uh, but my problem is not that I don't think they're there. It is literally the absence of data. If you read my recent books, what you will find is some wonderful little stories about those medium-sized enterprises that have just flipped the world upside down in their little market space. I mean, the one I always loved, uh, which I've written about in the last two books, and maybe even before that, is a company in mid-central Connecticut called Basement, B-A-S-E-M-E-N-T, Basement Systems, Inc. And their life is to take Roger's moldy old basement and get it clean and sweet and turn it into a playroom, turn it into an extra bedroom, uh, and, you know, it's allowed them to grow to be a hundred million dollar company. And Larry Chinesky, who runs it, uh, wrote a book called Dry Basement Science, which sold brilliantly. So I love those. You know, it's about as many miles away from Silicon Valley as it is possible to be. And it's doing something and it's done something cool. And it's doing good for the world. Uh, and and th those are those those are the people who who just make me. They don't make me smile. They make me grin. Yeah, I think maybe the larger you get, the tougher it is. I know um, uh, one of my favorite stories is Carl Sewell, who now uh, Sewell is one of the biggest car dealers in the country with uh, branches in multiple cities and all kinds. Every brand you can think of represented. But his focus was on customer service, and he really sort of carried that philosophy through. He wrote a book about customer service, uh, yeah. much, much like your basement guy, perhaps. And he was able to replicate that way of operating, uh, you know, across multiple units uh, as they grew and grew. I don't know how they're doing today. Uh, I mean, I think they're doing fine. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little behind. I, I don't know if they're the still story, that good. The story but. is clearly accurate. And, you know, the other thing that's always fun to me, like the teacher standing in the doorway, is you can come up with a hundred little things they've done. One, one I remember is the most important thing about your car dealer is how good they are at repairing cars and fixing cars. And one of the things that Carl would do is he would insist when you were buying the car that you make a tour of the space where the mechanics were and meet a few of the mechanics. Uh, because he said, I know it's a perfect car, General Motors is God, but it's not going to work every minute of every day. And I want you to know the kind of group we've got here who will support you. I think stuff like that goes under a category that's damn near called, you know, true genius to, you know, have, have that kind of an integration for both sides. I mean, on the one hand, that makes Roger the buyer feel good, but more than Roger the buyer, uh, Tom the mechanic says, this is really cool. You know, my boss thinks I'm the most important person around and he wants me to meet his customers. And as we now know, I don't know whether it was always, I don't think it was always true. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 150% of the profits of an automobile dealership come from the service department, not what goes on, at, on out on the sales floor. True, that may change with electrics, but you know, that story, uh, yeah. which is great. I didn't know uh, that particular story, but... Uh, it uh, reminds me of something else that's uh, both in uh, your current book and uh, in my Brainfluence book, and it's a story about radiologists who uh, one study found that they were more thorough and accurate in reading x-rays when there was a little picture of the patient attached. And it's almost the same thing as uh, the mechanic meeting the customer. Suddenly, absolutely, uh, you know, ju just an engine. I know there's a customer on the other side of that. Uh, and, well, and uh, you know, how, make so, yeah, sure that's, that's the people who are really watching thing. and listening to us, it led to... 80% better diagnosis. Because, you know, what's a radiologist do? A radiologist is sitting 10 miles away or in Mumbai, India, and, you know, we've got the next, the next test results coming up. What does he see? He sees charts, 
graphs numbers. Uh, that's all. And he makes his judgments from that. And this does. It, and, they, and they, you know, the, the, this research piece, which was published by the American Radiological Society, it wasn't published by a PR firm, uh, you know, it, 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 it made it entire. You spent more time. They did empathy tests. And the radiologist in Mumbai or Philadelphia on those empathy tests, which I think are pretty reliable or can be pretty reliable, said that you empathize with the patient. And I saw your frigging picture for, you know, four and a half seconds. But suddenly I was looking at data associated with a real living human being. I mean, I, I think that. that's something that I could mean, be I, tried, I, I uh... will be the first to admit I get off on stories like that. Right. And I think, you know, we've just seen two examples of uh, humanizing the customer, so to speak, or the patient. Uh, you know, I think that probably amongst our audience uh, members, they could think of some way of doing that. If there's that disconnect between somebody who is uh, providing a service or just part of the overall company delivering their product or service, uh, when they see the customer as a human being on the other end, chances are they're going to be a little more engaged, a little more conscientious. Uh, uh, and it's really, I think, a win for everybody yeah. because it also well, makes them feel better. Which is pretty obvious from our couple of examples. The investment cost is zero. I mean, maybe it costs an eighth of a penny to take a picture of somebody, but not today with an iPhone. It doesn't even cost an eighth of a penny. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's stuff that doesn't have a $2 million price tag associated therewith. Yeah, you know, Tom, in looking at the book and trying to figure out, I, I initially started by asking how it should be consumed. Uh, what I think that uh, uh, people should do uh, who, uh, first of all, they, sh they should obviously get, uh, get the book, but also, you know, to me, this would be an ideal thing if you have uh, a regular leadership meeting or staff meeting to just select a few pages that are on a certain theme, uh, you know, share those because obviously you could read those few pages in 60 seconds uh, yeah. or so uh, and then spend a few minutes discussing how they might apply to the unit, the business, uh, whatever, whatever size group this is, you know, to me, that would be so valuable because it, you know, it's one thing to read these things and say, yeah, that boy, that, that really makes sense. Uh, you know, people are important, yeah. but when you could bring a team together and focus on just one little thing, well, how could we uh, apply this idea? Uh, you know, to me, that, that would be the real win in this. And yeah, I, that, would, uh, that I, I, I guarantee you that down to the punctuation marks, what you just described is my ideal. In, ter in terms of the use, because I have no question that you're exactly right. I could read every word in this book. You know, if I said, you know, I don't have time to do the rest of the interview, Roger. I've got to have 10 minutes to read the book. In 10 minutes, I'll be back. Well, it's not quite that, but, uh, you know, it is, it is, I don't want to say one-liners. It is very condensed thought. Mm -hmm. And the other thing yes, I love just, about just, it, yeah. which I've always said in my presentations as well, uh, there ain't much Tom Peters in this. It is the Anita Roddicks who founded the body shop, who's responsible for the epigraph and people like that. It's all what I will call real on the line in the marketplace human beings. It's not some bloody academic guru who says it. I mean, I would like to think that the things that I say have, you know, appropriate background and so on. But the, the point is I want, I want Richard Branson to carry the message because we know what he's done and who gives two craps what Tom Peters has done. And he sure as hell hasn't run a company with, you know, 7,000 or 700 employees, 70 maybe, but not 700 or 7,000. <laughs> right. And that, that's what makes the book fun too. It's, it's not, I mean, it's one thing for uh, an expert and I would consider you an expert Tom to share wisdom uh, gained through experience and research and so on. But as you say, uh, hear from Richard Branson and some of these other great people, uh, you know, that makes it more impactful. And you do have a few of your own ideas interspersed throughout, but uh, I didn't do a, an analysis, but not not all that many of them. Uh, but overall, the compilation is great. Tom, uh, this, this has been a lot no, of fun. I will, I, will, I will admit to your uh, charts that there is a handful of Tom in there. Right. Well, that's a good thing. It, it would be wrong if there wasn't. Uh, Tom, yeah. how can people find you and your ideas? TomPeters.com, uh, which has every damn thing that I've done for the last 20 years, every, every PowerPoint slide presentation, et cetera. Uh, it will have a link very boldly at the top of the first page 
associated with this interview that you and I are having. Uh, we have a, a similar, more or less similar uh, website called excellencenow.com. Uh, I'm not sure with Mr. Musk in charge, but you can also find a lot of me at Twitter, at least at this moment. Uh, you know, I've got, you know, I hate to use numbers like this because it sounds like I'm trying to pretend I'm a hot shit. I've got 175,000 followers and I do an awful lot of tweeting. And what, what I, let's just, it's hard to leave Mr. Musk alone, but what I like about Twitter is the conversations, you know, the conversation with you or the conversation with uh, a woman by the name of Sharon Watkins, who was the whistleblower for the Enron fiasco. And, you know, she responded to some tweet of mine, and we've been talking ever since. I mean, it's very normal people, and it's people who just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's conversations. And I will admit, my wife says we have to get a divorce if I stay on Twitter after Musk took over. And I haven't quite figured out how serious she is. And I'm certainly distressed, uh, but I'm not going to run out the door at this point because it, it, it does, to be very selfish, it does what I want it to do. And it does it for me in a, you know, in a conversational way. Right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that uh, Twitter doesn't uh, uh, go completely in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah. Uh, you might have to cough up eight bucks, though, to keep that blue star. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's not that's, that big of no a deal. No doubt anyway, about that. Tom, yeah. Tom uh, hey, uh, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, good luck with the new book. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it was just a, it was a lovely conversation, and I have enjoyed every minute of it. And thank you for your serious preparation. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. Definitely.